privacy knoll that got people's attention and got them running that way. And again, in my opinion, I believe it was a diversion. But if you actually look at how the bullet entered the head from the right side and then exited the right side as well, I mean, that that's, you know, physically impossible. Right. And for trajectory information, I would say, you know, uh, take a look at somebody like Sherry Feaster, who's also yep. been a guest on this show. Exactly. She's okay. great. Exactly. An actual crime scene investigator. Yeah, okay. an expert. Fancy that. <laughs> yes, right. an actual expert. Is definitely hands down. Right, and and as far well, as the files, know, it all comes to... I'm sorry, as far as the files thing goes, though, I just want to say one thing about that. The Roscoe White timing is a lot longer than you than you guys probably think. You, you guys think of the Ricky White thing as the first time the Roscoe White thing came out, but uh, no, that was introduced earlier. That was introduced earlier, and it That's all right. it all actually came from the fact that uh, that uh, Roscoe White's widow turned over one of the backyard photographs to the House Select Committee at one point. Yes, she did. And she had a copy. Mm -hmm. She had a copy that nobody else had. Um, right. right. Now, that's easily explainable, believe it or not, without adding Roscoe White to the conspiracy. Uh, right. but, uh, the, fact, the fact of the matter is, is that pieces of evidence seem to disappear from the police station in Dallas. And if Roscoe White was a cop and being around there, that would make perfect sense. A lot of evidence was being taken as souvenirs. Right. Uh, thank you. Exactly my reasoning, which is, you know, which I knew from actually speaking to Dallas police officers. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, what would they know, Chuck? <laughs> well, they, they, they wouldn't know much. They were just, you know. The, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. I know. But anyway, the Jimmy Files story, the problem is that it doesn't line up with the existing evidence, it doesn't line up with reason. You can't find the figure that files would be in any of the photographic evidence, and it falls apart on the face of it. Bob Vernon is the guy who actually sold it to Wim Dankbar, and Wim does his thing with it, and that's the world according to Wim. I don't yeah. know what to say. Well, and, and that's fine. It's, 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 it's the same category to me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Files and Baker fall into the same category for me. Yeah, they do. Well, no, they are. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, they're the yes. same thing. They both go back to Dunk Bar. You know, that's that that's the issue, is that not only do we have these myth makers, we have people funding them. Which is a whole other interesting issue. But anyway, let's continue to tackle this stuff, because believe it or not, we're through the first hour, guys. I know. We could go all day, I'm sure. <laughs> so let's get on to... This is one of my favorites, by the way. Uh, LBJ is the mastermind of the assassination. Oof. Uh. Now, this is a long, drawn-out mythology. Okay? Why do I say that? Well, it's kind of logical, considering in the 1960s, if you think to yourself, well, you know, he became president. He, you know, if you're talking about 1966, 1967, you might think to yourself that LBJ might have something to do with it. First of all, it was public knowledge that the guy had all sorts of corruption charges around him, okay? It was. The whole Bobby Baker scandal, not something that was discovered, you know, by uh, Barr McClellan, okay? Uh, the fact is that the Bobby Baker scandal, if you listen to broadcasts of local radio in Dallas and Fort Worth that day, you can hear the headlines about the Bobby Baker scandal while JFK is visiting Dallas, okay? If you don't believe me, I'll send you the file. Moving on, he's assassinated Kennedy in the state where Johnson's from. So it's not a, it's not a horrendous thing to imagine that LBJ could be involved. He benefited because he became president. He obviously had control of certain things in that state. I mean, after all, John Connolly is directly relatable to him. The other guy was wounded in the car. Okay? A whole lot of other people that are involved in the motorcade, the choice of buildings, all these kinds of things. It makes kind of sense. But there's a problem. Uh, well, a problem. That's funny. There's a lot of problems here. <laughs> and I have given people the context and, Carmine, if you want to start, go ahead. But I want to make uh -oh. sure we hear from Zach and Trish on this, too. Okay. You, you, I, I'll let them go first if they wish. I want to be more they, – they are the people I would like to be the stars. They are the new guests. Oh, uh, no, 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 no. You're doing a wonderful job. You go ahead, Carmen. 
<laughs> Thank you, guys. Uh, well, this is a special place right. in my heart because it relates to a, a guy I'm sure that everyone in the Garrison group wanted me to give a shout-out to, Dave Sharp. <laughs> Dave is an interesting fellow who has constantly shadowed most of our forums trying to push the LBJ myth. And I tried to explain it to Dave, but he wouldn't listen. So hopefully if he's listening now, he'll listen this time. It is highly improbable that Lyndon Baines Johnson was part of the conspiracy. He was part of the cover-up. I will give everyone that. He was totally part of the cover-up. He didn't want any of this to escalate into something he couldn't control. So that, that, I think, is fairly established by evidence, and most reasonable people can accept. Lyndon Johnson, like all the other politicians, didn't want this to turn into something else. However, he likely had no part in the assassination. Now, what you said, you said people say, well, it was in Texas. Yeah, it was, which would obviously link back to him. So why would he do it where it would link back to him? That's a big problem, isn't it? Yeah. You know, and, and here's the thing. I am willing to accept the idea, and, and I'm going to let, you know, Trish and, and, and Zach get on this, but I'm willing to accept the idea that somebody tapped him on the shoulder and said, you're going to be president soon. I'm willing to accept that. I'm willing to accept that he might have even had some foreknowledge, although he wasn't ducking at the time and all that other nonsense. But that aside... Uh, I'm willing to accept that possibility. I'm willing to accept that a completely corrupt politician got swept up in something, tried to control the investigation, especially through his personal relationship with Hoover. Jake or Hoover. Okay. Hoover. So Hoover, again, who, you know, basically framed and let go anybody he wanted to and controlled loads of dirty information on people from the inception of his office with the FBI. But okay. Yep. Okay. I'll accept all of that. But him planning it, hell of a reward to only have one shadow presidency of his own, uh, to wind up a broken man, and to have his legacy destroyed. Exactly. Okay. And, and how, how about the shooting gallery? Why would he be there? If there was a miss, anyone could be hit. Yeah, and I'm sorry. I absolutely believe the phone call where, where he's talking to uh, Hoover. And he says, you know, were any of those bullets intended for me? That sounded like an honest question, especially considering there was no way in hell he had any idea that anybody in the public would ever get to hear that tape. That was for his private use. Yeah. Whenever I hear people talk about the tapes and the things that he could have said, he wouldn't have been using as many racial epithets if he thought that these tapes were going to be listened to. Much like Nixon. Yeah. <clears throat> I'd like... To I'd like to um, bring up a. I'd like to bring up an interesting anecdote that relates to this, and it's uh, the story of Godfrey McHugh, who was uh, in the Air Force, and he was uh, originally supposed to ride in the presidential limo and got moved, incidentally. Mm -hmm. But after the assassination, Godfrey McHugh wanted to track down Johnson and get permission to take off, and they couldn't find him, and they found Johnson evidently in the bathroom of Air Force One, crying. And telling McHugh, look out, this is a conspiracy. And, and it, you know, why, if he was the mastermind of it, would he be crying and, and telling one of his generals that this was a conspiracy? Yeah, Johnson had doubts, too, for years. I have documents that I'm more than happy to share with you guys and those who are interested, where uh, Walter Jenkins, his personal assistant, told Hoover that Johnson was having a moment of doubt where he said he knew the CIA was somehow involved. I mean, this isn't... Johnson was not the villain that so many have wasted time trying to portray. He was a villain. He wasn't a good man. But that doesn't mean he was the leader of the assassination. Oh, yeah. Let, let, me, let me be very clear. I'm not saying that this guy was innocent in any way, shape, or form. What I'm saying is he's not the planner. He's not the architect of what happened here. No, That's he's not smart saying. enough. I'm sorry. No, all, of, all, 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 all of the... All of the, you know, all of the, like you're saying, the, the recordings saying that he thought one of the bolts was, you know, wondering if one of them was meant for him and him being upset about this seems to me to indicate that he knew that something was going on, but he in no way was the one that planned it. And yeah. I also think by him being in the parade, I think that he was close enough to hear the shots, you know, and that that's a very powerful thought. If you think about it, he just witnessed the man above him being murdered. And I think it's very powerful that he knew that 
potentially that could happen to him too. And I, again, I, I like to use the expression, he heard the shots. He knew what potentially could have happened to him. And I think that's really important. And at that point, he was expendable in the sense that he was easy to maneuver the way that they wanted him to. But isn't that the case with all these guys post-Kennedy? And I believe that also, believe it or not, Nixon was removed for the same reason, that he wasn't cooperating. Oh, I agree. Yeah, okay. assassination is not their only tool. Right. Absolutely. You know, and they had already decapitated. Right. They had already I think decapitated. Nixon bit the hand that fed him. You, you got it. You got it. I, I, I am so glad to be on the air with you guys. You have no idea. I'm going <laughs> to tell you what. Now I'm going to open those phone lines. I, I'm going to open those phone lines, though, and I don't know what we're going to get. But I invite anybody who wants to call in now to ask about any of the subjects we covered or anything else related to the case. And you know what? If I've got any sort of clue or any of my guests have any sort of clue, we'll be more than happy to give you our ideas about what's what. Okay? And, and let's not forget that, you know, there are the major myths and there are also the minor myths. Okay, uh, the whole, well, there were fake Secret Service agents everywhere. That was bandied about for many, many years. The sewer shot from X-Files. The sewer shot, which is an impossibility. Uh, the, and, and let me just back up with a little bit of evidence on the fake Secret Service agents and how so many witnesses saw them, okay? Uh, the first thing is, there is a Secret Service agent named Lem Johns. Um, if you could just turn down your radio. There we go. Yeah. Oh, thank you, man. Hold on just a second. Secret Service agent Lem Johns, take a look at his testimony and just imagine for a moment that he's not lying. It is very easy to see how a Secret Service agent running around with his credentials open at that time could be spotted by various people in the crowd who are frozen, some of which have thrown themselves on the ground. So there ends a whole lot of that speculation. Maybe not all of it, but let's try and trace these things back to the evidence, okay? So, I have one caller on. I have another one coming in. Uh, Charles first, though. How you doing, man? I'm doing good. How are all you guys doing? Doing all right. Hey, so Charles. Hey, guys. How you doing? I'm what? doing good, folks. We're finally talking face-to-face -face after messaging back and forth for the last God knows how long. And, and you are live on the air, so... No doubt. Please, go ahead and contribute to the conversation. All right. Well, basically, I've been listening since you just after you guys started about an hour ago or whatnot, and you guys have been knocking them off. All uh, my neck's getting sore from nodding from what you guys keep saying because <laughs> everything you say, one after another after another, is like bang on. I mean, <laughs> you've got Doorway Man, you've got LBJ did it, you've got um, uh, I'm probably going to bring up JVB. And yep. the one that really bugs me the most, uh, because I run, as a lot of you may know, a JFK site, is the limo driver. That yeah. just bugs me to no end, because it, we get it constantly. <laughs> and it just bugs me, because it's so easy to disprove. But you get these stubborn people on there, and this is true with all of the subjects, you get these stubborn people on there, and they don't want to admit that they're wrong. Even when you can show straight up that they're wrong. It's just nonsense. Yeah. They, 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 they personalize it, unfortunately. Yeah, and why do people get so personal over this? I mean, it's one thing to have a disagreement. You can disagree with someone and still be respectful towards them. But yeah. so many people make it so personal that you disagree, all of a sudden insulting them. What for? Yeah. Yeah, oh, well, that's you know. right. That's right. It bugs me when people do that. And, I mean, I'm not one to do that. You guys have dealt with me long enough to know that. But there's so many people out there that do. And it just, even like, I'll even say if there are people that I discuss, and I think you guys know them too, guys like, uh, you know, Fred James, Steve Rowe, and so on. Most of these people are lone gunmen. Oswald did it on their own stuff. And I completely disagree with that. But there's no reason why, even though we disagree with them, we can't talk to them in a respectful manner. Yeah. But friends. there's we other people friends, that too. have the same opinion where you can't. You know, yeah. And just just really quickly, of course, uh, David Von Pine has an excellent video collection. Okay. Yes, he does. Uh, anyway, he doesn't like to debate much with me, but, yeah, he's got a real nice bunch of videos. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. 
Okay, two things. First of all, unknown caller, I can't accept you because if I do, it will knock us off the network. Okay, so you're going to have to unblock your number if you want to get in. Uh -oh. Next thing is... I wonder who they're from. <laughs> but, uh, but I wanted to make that announcement. Plus, we also have another call around uh, 617. How you doing? 617. Eric. I'm great. I'm great. I just want to say nice show. I want to shout out to my three favorite researchers out there, which is the Hitman. Nice. Hey, Hitman, how you doing? Hey, I'm how good. you doing? Just, thanks, <laughs> hey, guys, thanks for the shout-out. I appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to touch base on something Carmen said earlier. Um, when you really start digging into what authors are writing and you start looking at the primary sources, very often you're going to find they're just listing someone else's sources and they've never looked at the actual documents. Mm -hmm. And that leads to a continued mythology. <laughs> Yep. Um, that, that is really yes. frustrating uh, when you're, you've got people citing other people's books and you, when you as a researcher start digging and you find the actual document that people are quoting and it says nothing even remotely close to what they're using it for. So, Carmine, would you like to yeah. cite an example of this? Oh, the documents? Oh, oh sure. document. I, I think I might be able to take the one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mark Lane has a document that everyone loves to cite, but no one really looks at the exact document. They just cite his movie or they cite his books. Now, the document does say the word Mauser as Lane contends. However, if you read the whole document, the only thing that sounds like Mauser is that word Mauser. Everything else goes with the Carcano, and it's from two days later before they even knew what street Kennedy was hit on. So they made a mistake, like they made so many other times. Instead, Lane <laughs> took that and forever has bandied it as there was a Mauser. There wasn't. I also have a document of Roger Craig's original interview with Mark Lane. Guess what they don't mention? A Mauser. <laughs> one other document misrepresentation, which is one of my favorites, which is out there and is part of the mythology in the alternative media, is Executive Order Number One 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 Zero. Now, yes. anybody want to tackle that really quickly? The Federal Reserve thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I leave that open to you guys. I've done it enough. Play somebody else. I've heard this one so many times. The whole JFK was going to end the Fed? Well, yep. first of all, let's examine what it is they show for proof, which is the U United States note, okay, which existed long before Kennedy took any, any sort of office which existed post-Kennedy all the way up to 1971 when there was a change in the monetary policy in this country because Nixon finally took us the rest of the way off the gold standard. Hello. Okay. <laughs> but read the executive order for a moment. What does it actually do? Anybody know? Oh, uh, no. I, after I saw the claims, you I just sort of... <laughs> you got this one, Trish? No, you go ahead. You're doing a great job. Okay. It's actually an augmentation of a previous executive order. Okay? And uh, it looks like Hitman dropped off the call. Uh, you know, you can call back in if you want, man. I have no problem as long as you can, you know, kind of not, not make a whole lot of noise. You're good. So you can hang out. But here's the thing. Um, it actually is an augmentation of a previous executive order. And what it does in reality is turn over the presidential privilege of deciding how many of these notes are issued to the Secretary of Treasury. That's what it actually does. And once again, unknown caller, I cannot accept you. You will have to unblock your number in order to call in. I'm sorry, that's just the way things work. It's not my rule, it's just the way things work. Can I make a quick joke? Sorry, Judith. Exactly, thank you. <laughs> Uh, you think alike. <laughs> uh, you know, she has to go Sorry, back. Sorry, Richard. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So please, first of all, read the document. And you know what? Don't believe me. 
don't believe me. If you want to read a similar analysis of this, and this should have been dispelled many, many years ago, if people accept the the uh, uh, if people accept the authority of somebody like you know uh, G. Edward Griffin on the subject of the Federal Reserve, go ahead and enter G. Edward Griffin and the JFK myth into a search engine. Just go ahead and do that. See what you come up with. You'll find that he printed an article in 2001 explaining this away once and for all. Now, maybe you don't believe the whole Jekyll Island thing, but I do. And I'm going to tell you right now, <laughs> if you understand the way that this guy did his research on that, and you also read the documents, I can't argue with you, Edward Griffin. So go ahead and look at that. If you like. Anyway, sorry. Go right ahead, guys. But do read the executive order. It, it is possible to get a copy of it. So what's next? <laughs> I, I leave the floor open. We didn't really get too many suggestions from, uh, from Zach and Trish. I mean, what, what didn't we cover, guys, that you really want to get to? Um, one thing I'd like to mention is... Um, Dennis Morset and his work with the Babushka lady. I think that uh, he's uncovered quite a few interesting topics regarding that, and I really do hope at some point you do get him on your show to take a listen to. Um, he's uncovered quite a few different things, including uh, information regarding the camera, which, of course, Zach had a part of helping him with, and I think that that's a very important topic, and I, I don't want to step on any toes by any means by bringing him up, but I do hope that at some point you do consider bringing him on. Yeah, we, we, I, I think that all of us agree that, like we said, the, the lines need to be redrawn. They shouldn't be pro and anti-conspiracy because that infers a bias. They should be pro and anti-evidence. And I'll tell yeah. you what, if you look back at, uh, at Richard Sprague's work, uh, and I'm not talking about Richard Sprague who actually was you know, removed as the, uh, as the uh, chief counsel for the House Select Committee. I'm not talking about that Richard Sprague. I'm talking about the other one. Okay, the guy who did photo analysis. If you take a look back at him trying to track down who the Babushka lady was, that sounds a hell of a lot more plausible than Beverly Oliver. I'm sorry, I told Brett Holland the same thing on this show that, you know, although I agree that he had some very good sources in his book, one of the ones that I would have absolutely advised him against using was Beverly Oliver because I simply don't buy her story. Uh, it's that simple. You know, and Gee, there's, there's reasons for this, but, you know, I'm wondering, if anybody doesn't know, by the way, just, I always got to rewind this, because, you know, I forget, I, you know, I'm speaking to people that understand all this stuff like I do, and once again, uh, blocked number caller. <laughs> you. you think I'm kidding, this is like, they never learn, they never learn. Five or six of these now, blocked numbers cannot be accepted. Okay, I, if you allow your number on, <laughs> I can bring you into the show. Otherwise, not, it doesn't I, work. I wonder why they're not letting their number in. It's not like they don't have anything honest to say, do they? <laughs> I, I don't know, because I didn't speak to them. Anyway. <laughs> see? See? There you go. I had to well, put you back into the... I, I hope that everybody... Re I'm sorry, Chuck. Please go on. I just wanted to respond real quick. Well, okay, the Babushka lady, just a quick explanation. There is a woman who is easily seen in the Zapruder film and also the Knicks film, the, you know, the alleged copies that we have now at this point in time, uh, that is wearing a scarf over her head and a coat and all of that, and she's standing in the vicinity of, uh, uh, well, let's see now, let's think about this, Charles Bram, um, Mary Mormon, she's on that side of the road, okay, opposite from the grassy knoll, and she seems to be holding something up to her face. And for many, many years now, people have accepted that this is a lady named Beverly Oliver. I have reviewed her accounts of things. I have reviewed the photographic evidence. I simply do not believe her. Now, could I be wrong? It's a possibility. But that is where I stand on the subject. But just so everybody knows, this is who we're talking about, and Beverly Oliver used to uh, make a very big deal out of when she was on the Geraldo show or whatever, which did remind me just now that we did not touch on Madeline Duncan Brown. But anyway, <laughs> uh, we, we, yeah, we well, should no. do that before, before the party. time. 
because the assassination party is important, isn't it? Exactly. Okay. <laughs> My, but, but, but hang on, but hang well, on just, just I, I, I just think all of us on the call here are like the only people in the world that weren't at this party because at one point or another, everyone seemed to be there. Yeah, absolutely. Even people who were documented as being in other yes. places. Yeah. For, for instance, J. Edgar Hoover. Yeah. yeah. Well, just, how many people yeah. saw him? Apparently the party was for him. him. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't want to cut anybody off. I was just going to say, too many people saw an executive action and then made that happen in their mind. Yep. I mean, it's not that it isn't feasible that a meeting occurred with some people at some point, but once again, Johnson had no... I, I think they're trying to call again. <laughs> no, that, that's just a little bit of noise coming off of Charles there real quick. I don't know what... <laughs> Sorry about that. My, my phone slipped on me. Oh, it's okay. But, but Johnson likely wasn't there. Uh, Hoover likely wasn't there because Hoover wasn't dumb enough to go to that meeting. I mean, it's, people don't understand. That's an implication, and then that's where it begins. This has to be a small, compartmentalized operation. This can't have tons of people knowing about it. Otherwise, someone's going to talk. Right. No, nobody's going to have parties where they uh, invite, you know, mistresses and random people to uh, to appear and uh, actually see for their own, you know, see with their own eyes the meetings that occur. This is, yeah, it lines up with well, well, how, uh, You want to know the best part? Is it supposed to be at Clint Murchison's house? Yeah. Funny enough, there are documents showing that Clint Murchison sold that house in 1962. Nice. So he decided, oh, let's throw a shindig at my old house. You're exactly Clint correct, Charles. Don't mind. That's You're great, Charles. You're exactly correct, Charles. That is one of the major, major issues with this. <laughs> <laughs> Duncan, Another thing, too, is... It's third party, too. In a court of law, they wouldn't accept hearsay. And in the oh. documentary, they have a, a maid that is discussing what the limo driver had said that apparently drove Hoover to and from the airport, so on and so forth, what another maid told her. In a court of law, that wouldn't be accepted. And yeah. I think that's very important to remember as well. If it's not accepted in court, it shouldn't be accepted in the court of public opinion either. Yeah, no, I, t I totally agree with that. I get into arguments with people all the time telling me this isn't a court. No, but, see, a lot of people always talk about how they want to reopen the case. Well, let me tell you a little thing. If you want to reopen the case, you need evidence. You can't just guess. Right. Right. And uh, yeah. you know what? I didn't even bother. I don't even remember giving out the phone number, by the way. That's the funny part, too. 718-717-8296. 718-717-8296, and you can't block your number. Which okay. Means, I think it's safe to say that we're not paranoid anymore. No. <laughs> no, absolutely not. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. I appreciate the help. Uh, well, you know, listen. <laughs> uh, you, you, got, you got to have a little bit of fun with this because after a while, man, it, it'll it'll make you really crazy. Yeah, it's laugh or cry, and I like to laugh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. And and uh, you know, and the sad thing is that you know, again, like I said at the top of the show, we take this seriously for our own reasons, and. You know, it's not about solving the great crime mystery for a lot of people. It's not about correcting history for a lot of people. It's not about, you know, it's all sorts of different motives. But here's the thing. If we can all agree to deal with the realities, what exists, what's left of the evidence anyway, okay, uh, and the best documentation we can get our hands on, the best testimony we can get our hands on from first-hand accounts, you know, this might become a whole lot more simple to deal with. And it wouldn't right. have to be something that requires a thousand volumes, okay, uh, or better at this point, uh, in the literature of all sorts of mainstream published books, which, of course, we didn't touch on the biggest mythology of all, which is sort of a, oh, a composite of the O'Reilly's, <laughs> Posner's, and uh, thusly all of the other Warren Commissioner defenders that have been out there, uh, you know, starting with David Bellin, of course, uh, moving on well beyond that. Of course, I don't know if you guys ever read David Bellin's book about this. No. No. Okay, well. No. When, when you have time and you feel as though 
you want to lose a few IQ points, go right <laughs> in. <laughs> it's not as... <laughs> It's I think not, I lost enough reading Cage clothes. Yeah. <laughs> How about Judas book? <laughs> I want my money back. I didn't pay for it, so I got a get. I got an autographed copy given to me for free from nice. somebody who didn't want it anymore. Well, if we're I don't lucky, know why they didn't want it. <laughs> if we're lucky, as the mists fade into obscurity, that'll be a rare collector's item. <laughs> Yeah. I, no, I'm hoping so. And I told you the story, Carmine, off the air about how I got a hold of my uh, <laughs> my Bugliosi book, right? Yeah. That was uh, a good one. This is a good one. Okay, 2,000 pages, all right? 2,000 pages from Bugliosi, and I won't even get into all the allegations about whether he did his own work or anything else. Nope, I don't need to do that. But let me tell you this. A $50 book is sitting in a bookstore, discounted on top of discounted, and it became $2.58. <laughs> so I decided it was time wow. to buy the book slash CD-ROM. Um, and this was not long after its release, ladies and gentlemen. This book stop, it, this doorstop of a book failed almost right away, despite all of its pre-orders. But, but anyway, back to it. And they released a, you know, a smaller version of it, you know, later, the four days of November deal. But I got mine, and I decided to go back to the rack and buy the other four that were sitting there because it was $2.58, with tax, by the way, which is 7% in New Jersey. So <laughs> I'm not sure exactly the math right this moment, but you can do it in your head. So I walk away with this cumbersome stack of books. I went outside to the nearest dumpster. I tore out <laughs> CD-ROM and, and an illustration section of one book, threw four of them into the dumpster, and walked away with my one copy, and proceeded to torture myself for the next, oh, at least a month trying to get through this boring thing. Thank you, Vince Bugliosi. I would really like my $2.58 at any time now, sir. But I would more, you know, since you have such great, uh, uh, you know, analysis about the universe and the nature of God in your later books, I would really like that portion of my life returned to me, if you can, so I can relive it without your book. With interest. Well, interest would be nice, but I'm not demanding interest. <laughs> anyway. So, guys, I just felt like I needed to say that because I don't know if I ever said that on the air, but I told Carmine that story, and he said, you gotta, you got to remember to tell people that. Yep. It's so, a lesson. You learned a lesson. <laughs> I learned an absolute lesson because the, the author of Helter Skelter, or the alleged co-author of Helter Skelter and <laughs> mythology, uh, also provides us with an overwhelming, boring volume of crap in the JFK case. So... Something to That's avoid. <laughs> Case closed? Yes. If you want to do a little bit of damage to your frontal lobe, fine. Next. Kill oh, Kennedy, well, killing Kennedy, killing Jesus, killing Patton, I think now. Well, yeah, my, my thing with Posner and O'Reilly, I think, is fairly well known. With uh, O'Reilly, it's another myth maker, and he finally got caught, which is awesome. And I credit... The family, I credit Jefferson Morley, I credit everyone that came out against him. People argue with me about why I liked an article where Hugh, Hugh Ainsworth came out against him because he's pro-commission. I don't care. It's the truth. Either you want the truth or you don't. See, that's the thing. If the truth is the truth, that's the end of it. And, yeah. and even, even with a guy like McAdams, who has been extremely you know, divisive over the years, yeah. I'm sorry. When he's right, he's right. Yeah, we're all right sometimes, and we're all wrong sometimes, and people need to start realizing that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so again, 718-717-8296, and blocked caller, I cannot take your call. <laughs> I am sorry. I think we have fans. Is that seven? I think that's seven yeah. attempts now. Uh, all right. Got to give them persistence. A for persistence, E for evidence. Uh, there you go. And we're actually an hour and a half deep here, so, man, oh, man, I'm now just going to throw it open and shut my mouth as best I can. I'm sorry, guys. I know I talk a lot, and I kind of pushed the subjects along, but I wanted to make sure we covered a lot of ground. You're great, Chuck. Don't worry about it. Okay, so if you guys feel as though something was left out, especially, uh, you know, because 
you and I kind of dictated the topics a lot here, Carmine. I'd love to hear from Zach and Trish about whatever it is that they think we left out. Okay, well, one of the things that pops into my mind, uh, maybe we touched upon it briefly earlier, is doorman. And, um, you know, how people tend to think that this is going to be, or, or did, or, and some people still do. I mean, we have a whole Oswald is Innocent committee that tends to think that this is the piece of evidence that's going to solve this or did solve it in their minds. But in reality, it, it's really just nothing more than that as we were talking about before. It's just you're staring at blobs. I mean, I, Trish and I put out a... Uh, an essay about, uh, you know, our analysis of Judith Baker's doorman pixelation analysis, which in reality was really, and I, you know, don't mean to criticize her particularly, but I guess this is the criticism. It was a really poorly thought out study. It was extremely juvenile almost, I hate to say. It. She backed it up with pretty much nothing, and she said this was the most important piece of evidence that she's found to date. And this is just the tip of the iceberg with this movement. I call it a movement because it is. It is they've basically taken this extreme, you refer to Elkins, it was that photograph, and, and it's, it, they take the blobs of what you can barely make out an image of a face and, and, and a body, and they're, and they're turning it into Oswald and using it as the touchstone, the Rosetta Stone for the entire case. I can't begin to say how irresponsible that is. Mm, yeah. Yeah, no, and, and she's not alone. Other people do it, too. Black dog man, hole man, prayer man, blah man. They make up new names, they come up with a myth, and they try to sell it. What, what is the name for that? Uh, I always forget Wait, this. What do you... go, go ahead. No, go ahead, sorry. No, go ahead. Go right ahead. <laughs> now we're all too polite. I'm trying to handle... Oh, questions. okay. Well, you, you just... You, you, keep, you, you, you have to almost wonder... What sort of psychological mechanism comes into play that allows people to do this and then carry this torch until the end of their lives almost? I mean, goodness, you can present evidence that, that says that, you know, well, I think you're wrong here, and they just don't want to hear it. What, it almost borders on some sort of, I don't want to say, you know, mental illness almost. Uh, actually, religion is what I like to use. It's like religion. They've convinced themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're putting faith into it. You're putting, right, Trish said, you're putting faith into something. That's really what it is. I myself am a faithful person. I'm a religious man, but I, I definitely see comparisons in, in the way that, you know, there, there is no quote-unquote evidence, uh, you know, hard empirical evidence that God exists. It's faith. But once again, there's no hard empirical evidence that Oswald was doorman, but yet people still just stick to their guns and no matter what. And even Oswald stated that he wasn't in the doorway. So, again, going with, you know, Oswald spoke the truth all the way through his interrogation, and people need to believe him, but they don't believe him on this. He's wrong. He didn't know where he was. Exactly. You know, it, it seems silly to me. You know, it's cherry-picking the information that fits the story. Yep. No consistency. Absolutely. And, uh, okay, so we got a question from the chat room regarding the Don Adams uh, uh Ah, from an office building with a high-powered rifle uh, yeah. scenario. Um, what, what was it? Miltier. Yeah, the whole Miltier yeah. thing. Yeah. I'll, I'll go, or one of you guys can go, whatever you want. Yeah. I surely sure all know this one. <laughs> and, then, and then after that, we have another caller. So. You want me to go, or you guys? You go, go ahead, for it, Carmen. Okay, well. Miltier, in my opinion, is a possibility. I think that there are some credible researchers out there looking into the nationalist movement angle. I think that they could have been part of it, but once again, like the Mafia, they were not in control. It had to be a rogue agent, or it had to be somebody with the CIA tactics of the Guatemala documents from 54 to set this up properly. Right. Uh, 540 yeah. area code, you're on. Um, uh, good evening. How Sorry. are you? It's uh, Schmutzi out of the, um, uh, the chat room. Oh, well, hold on a second. I was trying to get to the uh, 540 caller. Sorry, I'm hold sorry. On. Hold on a second, Schmutzi. Uh, 540, you're on. How you doing, sir? All right, how you doing? Good, this is your boy, Rob Clark, to the Lone Gunman Podcast. Nice! <laughs> Hello, Rob! Hey, um. Rob! <laughs> we did a shout-out. Hey, I just wanted to call and tell you all what a great job you're doing, and I am thoroughly enjoying the show, and it is much 
needed and much overdue. That's great, man. We're glad to hear from you. Yes. Thank you, Thanks. Rob. Thank, Thank you. Nice to talk to you, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go eat dinner. You all have a great night, and I'll still be listening. Oh, <laughs> <not today. laughs> you too, Rob. Thanks, all right, Rob. See you Take care. Yep. Peace out, bro. Yep. Later, Later, Rob. The Peace. 402 area code. You're on. Uh, am I on? Yes, you are. Hey, guys. Uh, I, I really appreciate this show. Uh, this is Fred James, actually. Wow. Yes. I did, did, I did, did, my, did I hear my name mentioned? Yes, you did. You were one of the good ones. <laughs> oh, okay. <Yeah. laughs> I, I, I misinterpreted. I thought I thought it was something that uh, uh, something uh, derogatory or negative, but uh, oh, I no. guess uh, no. I guess no, my man, just, my mares on the on the threads are uh, what? showing for the one. Uh, I think it, it was actually me. I think it was actually me. This is Charles Fred. Uh, I think it was actually me that brought up your name and. What I was just saying was basically that, uh, you know, that you uh, seem to be pretty, um, you know, pretty much into the Oswald was the lone shooter um, opinion. And I just brought up that there's yeah. guys like you and the other guy I brought up was like Steve Rowe who have these beliefs, but yet you still speak uh, to everybody in a respectful manner and you don't take shots at people just because they have differing opinions of you. And that's well, you when might, I you uh, might brought consider your name. Kind of funny. Yeah. Because uh, there's a caller that couldn't get in. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard the suggestion that maybe that could have been Judith Baker, but that was actually Steve Rowe. Oh, <laughs> oh, we're, oh, wow. we're, like, we're communicating with each other and uh, talking about the show. I mean, you guys are doing a good job. Trish and Zach are some of my most favorite researchers ever. The essay that they've done Fred. on Judith Baker, uh, the Pixel Degeneration, the analysis that she did. I mean, it just totally shows. Uh, it, it, it doesn't uh, give her any credibility whatsoever because it's just one more point. That, and these points can just add over and over and over again. It just keeps adding up. And yeah. if you keep debunking the person in different areas of, of her, you know, the alleged allegations she's making, uh, how, can you, how can you be considered by anybody to be credible when you have so many things that just get, continues to get knocked down. So I don't, you know, mm. it's just one of those things, and I just wanted to show my appreciation for uh, the, the work they've done on that. And Carmine, or, uh, the premium that you put on evidence, I mean, it's just like very strong everywhere that you put it. And I really appreciate that. It keeps me on my toes. I mean, you, you guys have seen me in the threads debating things. Um, I'm kind of nervous, so just... Uh, You're doing great, Fred. Right, don't worry about it. No, Fred, uh, please, like... take, take, a, take a breath for a second, man. I want to say something. You're, you're a guy who, who believes Oswald did it? Yeah, actually, uh, it, a 22-year journey. I actually did think that there was room for a conspiracy until a little over a year ago. I made a little bit of a transition. Uh in my opinion, if there was a conspiracy, it would have to involve Oswald as a shooter. Okay. Uh, well, and then the, the conspirators who would have been involved would be unknown at this point. That's, in my opinion, that's the only way. I, that it could I be think that's wholly reasonable, Fred. I don't, I don't think that we can attribute innocence to Oswald utterly. That's, that's a bias. So mm -hmm. that's why I think we can get along is because... He has, he's a patsy. That means some sort of connection somewhere. Now, whether he was set up early or whether he was part of the engineering of the plot, I think, is the question that remains. Yes, I think that's right. possible. But right now, I don't think it's probable. It's, it's a possibility in my mind, but I just don't think that's what happened. But that's not why I called to, to talk about that. But I, I just wanted to uh, make one comment, though, about the, uh, the Bush lady. Okay. I actually attended a conference... Uh, last November, and uh, I saw the shoes Beverly purports to be the shoes she wore on that day. Those are not the shoes of the Babushka lady. The shoes that you can see clearly in the, the uh, Skaggs and Allen photographs, mm -hmm. those are the shoes that she says that are those shoes, those are clearly not the same shoes. Well, That's you know you know what happens, Fred, in, in the fringe end of this stuff. 
is obviously the photographs and the films of the babushka lady wearing those other shoes have all been drawn in. You know, this is the, and, and, and believe me, I'm saying this sarcastically. This is not my viewpoint. <laughs> okay. But this know, is the nonsense. You're going to say exactly what you're saying. Yeah. is going to be said. This is the nonsense that will be generated when you present them with the contradiction. And here it is. <laughs> you know, and I just want to say really quickly, and, I, you know, I apologize because it is my show, so I want to say this to you. I'm really happy that somebody that thinks Oswald did it called in. I really am. Because I'll tell you what, I would believe that a whole lot faster than I would ever buy a tenth of what's in that me and Lee book. Okay? <laughs> I, would, I would gladly accept that a whole lot faster than that. Right. And in fact, I'll tell you a funny thing, too, and I know I've never said this anywhere, but the realistic way that I started this journey was to disprove conspiracy theory. I really felt as though it was very strange what happened, because when I was nine years old, I thought it was very weird that a guy was killed while in the custody of the police. Okay? That shook me. But then I thought the kooky conspiracy theories are ridiculous, all of them. Problem yeah, is... They, they... We have very, we have common ground there, yeah. and uh, that, that's the one thing that needs to be pointed out. That's somewhere we, we can come together. But and the funny thing also is, actually, uh, up until about a year ago, it, it was people like uh, Zachary and Trish and some other friends that I consider them. I really do consider them friends of mine now. And now Carmichael, who I've gotten to know uh, over the past several months. Actually, uh, people who make me look at the case, from an evidentiary point of view, that's actually what caused my transition. The only room I leave for conspiracy now is as I previously described. But uh, actually, it's uh, these people who are, you know, who I consider the, some of the greatest researchers who have shown me that the way to look at this is through the eyes, of, through the scope of uh, evidence. That's what made me uh, the way I am now. I mean, I'm just give you a little bit of history about myself. That's not the reason why I called. I just wanted to point out the thing about the Babushka lady. Uh, but uh, uh, I did make a transition. I was a conspiracy theorist since the early 90s uh, until last year. But because of this show and shows like it and the research that's going on that I can totally agree with, it makes me want to call in and talk to you guys. It makes me want to chat on the sites. Because we have common ground. We have a place where, you know, where we all agree that there's some ridiculous things floating around out there. And to me, it's disrespectful to the history to have such things out there uh, trying to cause division and trying to distort uh, what we, some things that we can come together and know as fact. Some people are just trying to, to distort them. And yep. I, in my opinion, those things need to be pointed out. That's why this show is very important. Uh, and people need to look into these things on their own, do their own research, and find out for themselves. I've made many trips to Dallas. I've talked to Eugene Boone in person. I've done things. I mean, I, I look at things. I measure things. I go and do these plaza and do things on my own so I can find out for myself. Mm -hmm. I, don't want to be, I don't want to just rely on someone's words or someone's book or someone else's research without checking some of the things out for myself. And, you know, that's that's my transition. That's just a little bit of a something I just wanted to put out there. No, uh, and 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 realistically, that's how I started out. That that's exactly how I started out. Is let me start to verify, because I happen to be in proximity to somebody who had been there. So I see a name mentioned in a book. I happen to know that they're in a particular city, and I would just pick up a phone book. I know that's an old reference at this point, but there used to be phone books in every city. Files. Yes, sir. And I remember those days, yes. You know, and I would pick them up and I would say, gee, you know, I heard that uh, a couple of the guys that used to work at Bethesda are now in Pittsburgh. Hmm. Guess what? Let me look them up. And a lot of times their phone numbers were listed. And I've said this on the air before. Some people would just hang up on me because who gives a crap? I was a kid, whatever. But some of them would talk to me and tell me, well, you know, that's not exactly what happened. Or, you know, you got to understand this or that. And... Thus the journey began, you know, actually comparing what, the, what people are saying witnesses said as opposed to what they have to say. You know, big difference in a lot of cases. 
And I, I, I see Fred's call, too, as important because it's showing that both sides can agree on some things. And I think that the most research development and the most progressive research was done when both sides were able to work together at times instead of always being at each other's throats because they disagree. Oh, right. I, mean, I, totally, I totally agree with that. Yeah. And you got to realize, too, that you're not going to agree on everything. It's just no. not going to happen. That's the nature of human, human nature. I mean, that's, and that's a good thing. That's I mean, some people well, are Yankees well, fans, some people are Red Sox fans. That doesn't mean that you can't, you know, still get along and have constructive discussions just because you're not, oh, well, this, if you don't disagree with me, I don't want to talk to you. That's not the way to go about things. It's not productive, and, and all it does is create bad feelings. I can give ample uh, examples of that with the base I've had with Trish, with Carmen, Carmine and with uh, Zachary, where we didn't agree. But we always can come together and find something where we do agree. Yep. Right. And we, we, the thing that we all want, for sure, we want accurate history. We don't want people making up things about this tragic event that affected this, the world. From the point that it happened, it affected not just the United States. It affected, it affected the whole world. And uh, we take it serious. We don't want distortions being made. We want, we want to find the truth. We're all looking for the truth. And there's truth on both sides. We, we need to just where we can come together and find them. Yep. One of the, one of the better examples of that, to be honest with you. I think a big part of it, too, is... Oh. Sorry, Trish. Well, one of the better examples Sorry, of that... I was going to say a big part of... <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Trish. <laughs> I was going to say that was part of the big downfall with the Garrison investigation, was he didn't have the resources or the manpower. And if nope. you think about it, the most powerful world leader was assassinated. This is a world stage thing. And if there's so many people throughout the world that are investigating this on their private time, they're not getting paid to do it, et cetera, et cetera. And if, you know, everybody's heard different legends, different stories, they have access to different information depending on where they are. And if we could bring that all together and harness that and work together, I think that we could move mountains together. Yeah, exactly. Well, and I was going to say that one of the best examples of that, to be honest with you, and, and this is often forgotten, is the universal agreement between people that absolutely believe that Oswald is the guilty party and the only guilty party, and those of us on the other side of that issue, okay, who came together after the Oliver Stone thing happened, okay, and the ARRB happened. Now, I know it's a big old document dump, and it's a hell of a daunting thing, and I can't even say that I've been through all of it myself, but wow. Yeah. There's one point at which we all came together and yeah. said, listen, if this is the truth that he did this, yeah. then there's no reason to keep withholding all of this stuff. Right. Let's have the files. Right. Let you prove. Right. That Oswald did it. You know what? If that's the way it comes out, if there is absolute proof in government hands that shows without any question, or not without any question, but just to a reasonable certainty that that's the answer, well, I, I might accept it if I can verify it. Yeah, there, there, the, there was a good point. Uh, I think it was Walt Brown, a uh, researcher there, uh, Walt Brown, who came out and he said, if it's such a cut and dry case, or cut and dry case, and Oswald's the one that did it, why is there even one piece of paper being withheld from people? If, if I could right. chime in real quick, the Castro plots, among others. There were lots of illegal operations woven into the assassination and peripheral to it that they don't want us to know about. But the bottom line is it's going to come out. So holding off on it just makes you look worse. Right. Right, and and all and of the this other. This is my position on the a AARB and, and the any information that may potentially come out. I want the truth. I, I'm I can be influenced back the other direction if the if I figure that the evidence has gone that way. Yeah. If there's a conspiracy, I mean, it's clear and plain to me. I'll go back to the other way. But I'm, I'm the way I am now because of the way I see it. So if yeah. there's, I, no. you know, I, I don't have any biases. I do have biases, and I do have emotion about the whole thing. My, I'm more emotional about the truth now than anything else. Uh, well, because after a while, after a while, that's exactly where it goes, Fred, is that, you know, you don't any longer care about being married to a theory, okay? You actually want to know what happened. That's it. That's exactly. all you want. 
So let's get. When I started to find things out, like Mm -hmm. uh, I never believed Oswald was doorway man, but there were some other things that I did believe. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, here's an example: Uh, the parade route being changed at the last at the last minute, which I do not believe happened. When I found out that that was not true, Mm -hmm. I mean, I I, because I was such a uh, follower of Jim Garrison and other things uh, similar to that, and I found out that those things weren't true. It made me, like, uh, really angry and emotional. No. Uh, so finding, finding those things out, I did not, I, I, want, I wanted so bad to believe Oswald was completely innocent and was set up. I understand, I, was, I understand completely, and Garrison did very well with what he had, but he yeah. didn't have that much. That's what the problem was. Amazing right. that he got some of the things that he did, but... Still, it's not a complete, you know, we can't deify the guy. It doesn't work that way. Listen, we've got less than five minutes left, and uh, Schmutzy from the chat room added back in. So I'm wondering, Schmutzy, what you got to say, because somehow, I don't know, I lost you before. Yeah, no, you must have dropped me, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, the reason, uh, what I wanted to uh, just throw out there is I remember uh, years ago I heard of a guy named Don Adams. He was supposedly an FBI man. And I think you wrote a book, uh, I guess, with his take. I just wanted to know, uh, throw it out to the panel and ask them what you know, they thought about you know, that particular uh, account. There's also a well-known YouTube video with that guy on it as well. I threw, the, I threw a link to his, I think, books, uh, to, to his website into the chat for anybody who's interested. They could just scroll up, but, you know. Yeah, I- well, I'll be honest. I've I haven't seen that, so I will definitely review it. So thank you very much for adding that, Timothy. I do appreciate sure. that. Yeah. Chuck, you were telling me a little bit about him. Well, all right. Well, the, the Don Adams thing is is largely based again on the Miltier uh, 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 story, um, okay. and the problem with that is that it doesn't really go anywhere, um, yeah. unfortunately. And there's a lot of things that FBI agents, retired FBI agents, have come out and said, and it's really all over the map. Don Adams, in some ways, revisits a lot of very old sort of ideas about the assassination because this guy who was literally involved in fundraising for, uh, you know, for extreme causes, especially uh, uh, racial causes, literally taking money from people at certain points to... uh, to promote the idea of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, okay, uh, to try and collect money for those that would want to support his assassination. This guy is literally guilty of that kind of stuff. And Adams had a little bit of direct knowledge about this particular individual. Now, as per his involvement in the Kennedy assassination, I think it's a little far-fetched because they've sort of tied it to another one of these very blurry images in Dealey Plaza. Um, It is, however, remarkable that it seems as though he had some advanced knowledge. But then again, this type of advanced knowledge was in a lot of different cities. This is, again, another reason why I don't buy the whole it's a Dallas plot and it's the oil men and all this other stuff. Um, I don't think that Miltier was a player personally, but he's definitely a figure worth researching because the guy was involved in all sorts of chicanery regarding... uh, uh, racial politics and uh, and support of that kind of stuff at that time. Very much agree. Yeah. No, I, th- I think that Miltier, yeah. Miltier largely was a mid-level leader in the uh, racist movement. John Birch Society, wasn't it? John Birch yeah. Society. Yeah, Birch. Yeah, yeah, he was a mid-level leader. Yeah. He was I'm, – I'm not saying that it isn't possible that he could have heard wind of something somewhere – But he had no direct knowledge, in my view, and I also think that it was more of a response to Hoover utilizing illegal methods to destroy the Klan. You got it. That he would want to kill JFK, not any of the reasons people try to attribute. Right. Right. And look, uh, it's it's the timing issue. Yeah, absolutely. It it isn't, and it's an interesting subject worthy of study all on its own. Okay. Uh, uh, Had uh, uh, what Stu Wexler on, and we discussed this you know, uh, regarding the MLK assassination and the different plots that arose, and Miltier is tied to that. Whenever you want to do MLK or or RFK, you let me know. (laughs) Uh, 
any time. I think we're going to have to revisit this subject, though, because, guys, we're just about out of time. I want to thank, uh, first of all, uh, Carmine Stavastano, who is, you know, a recurring guest here now, and uh, also first-time guests Trish Fleming and Zachary Jandro, right? Jandro. Jandro. See, I knew it's true. Jandro, close enough. Jandro, Jandro. See, it's <laughs> okay. It's okay. You should hear what people do to my name. Uh, it's amazing. I, I, it looks pretty simple to me, you know, <laughs> but uh, anyway. <laughs> so I want to thank everybody who decided to tune in, and, of course, uh, all the people that are going to catch this later on down the line on YouTube or if you've downloaded it, shared it with your friends or whatever else. The Ocelli Effect is just about done, and you can find the archives at, the, at, at ucy.tv slash toe. Archives are there. Links to the YouTube playlist are there. Plus, I will post this show on the uh, Blind JFK Researcher channel on YouTube uh, uh, for the... Uh, I don't know how many subscribers are over there now, but I'm not very active, except I do post these shows because I think they're valuable, and I think that uh, we did some serious damage to the mythology tonight, although there is more to go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, Schmutzy, man, thanks for calling in, and a big thank you to Fred. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thanks for taking Thank my call. Guys. Thanks for putting yeah. up with my nervousness as well. <laughs> Not a problem, brother. Yeah, I like really. the, the truth like is the important thing. thing. Thank you, Charles, also for calling yeah. in. Go, go Thanks ahead. for having me on, Chuck. Absolutely, man. And you know what? Maybe we'll have to. Well, I don't know when we're going to plan it, but we're going to have to do this again, I think. Well, yeah. well, let me know. I'll <laughs> I'm <laughs> sorry.